Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day you have made and we rejoice in it. Heavenly Father, today we end our study of John chapter 6. It has been an amazing chapter, Lord, and I know that uh, you have taught me much. I have been astounded, and I thank you. Lord, we love digging into your word. There is so much treasure in us, in us to find. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, you would anoint my tongue to declare this message this morning and anoint every ear that hears it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we continued our study of John 6 and we heard the hardest words Jesus had to say to the Jews who had come to Capernaum to find him. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the Heavenly Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. What? Whatever could Jesus mean by telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Let's be clear. Jesus is not promoting cannibalism. The eating and drinking of a victim's flesh and blood. The devil does this. Jesus does not. What Jesus was doing throughout John 6 was this. He was comparing what the world had to offer with what he came from heaven to earth to bring to us. What the world has to offer doesn't last. The specific example we have from John 6 is that of bread. Okay? When we eat bread or we eat any meal, it doesn't last. It doesn't take long before we're hungry again. What Jesus has to offer the world, himself, and all that he has to give, feeds us, and that lasts to eternal life. The entire point of John 6 is Jesus telling those who were listening to him, that, and even those who were murmuring among themselves because of what he said, is that they needed to consume him and the things God had to give them rather than what the world had to give them. The difficulty in what Jesus had to say to these people in the first century and now to us in the 21st century is that everyone living in the world is immersed in the world. We're born into it. We live in it. We're going to die in the world. Switching gears, switching our attention away from the world onto Jesus is actually impossible for us. The good news is that God so desires to come you know, for us to come out of the world, that he acts to draw us out of the world and to his son. If God weren't involved, if God weren't at work to do this, no one would be able to come to Jesus. Absolutely no one. Thank God he works to draw us to his son. Thank God he wants to save all people. Thank God he sent his son into the world to do this. The key verse for understanding this entire chapter is verse 35 where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. We may not full, be fully aware of it, but ever since sin entered into the world, every single person hungers and thirsts after what was lost in the fall. People may not be aware of this, but people search for that. Augustine says there's a hole, you know, there's a hole in our, our spirit, in our hearts, that is not satisfied until it gets fed by Jesus, until it gets filled by Jesus. The world has nothing to offer anyone that can satisfy the spiritual hunger that we have. People search for it all over the place. 
but it's not going to satisfy them. Only Jesus can satisfy. And so God sent his son. He offers his son. He is the one we need to have that thirst satisfied and that hunger satisfied. But how Jesus put this, that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, was not at all met with faith even among many of his disciples. Let's hear their response in verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Well, the answer is no one can understand it apart from God. No one can understand the things of God apart from God. And the disciples were attempting to do this. Such a thing, such a kind of an attempting to understand this on their own, apart from God, that just leads to spiritual frustration. You can't do it. You can't wrap your mind around spiritual things. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The mind cannot discern spiritual things. So when we find ourselves in that situation, we've got to cry out to God and ask Him for help to help us, enable us to understand the things that we cannot understand. And he has promised to help us. The understanding may not come when we want it, or in the way we think it ought to come, but it'll come because God is faithful. He wants us to understand these things. And he's going to give us the understanding we seek. He's not going to leave us hanging out on a limb. No, he knows we cannot understand spiritual things apart from him. Verse 61 we read, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? Well, it's interesting. It certainly is one thing for those who weren't his disciples to complain. It's another thing altogether for his disciples to complain about this. Okay? They're balking at his words. They were even offended by his words. Okay? One of the things that we've got to understand when he's talking about, when we read these words, disciples here, he's not talking about the twelve. There were many disciples in Capernaum. Many of them. And so these were hearing these words. And they were, you know, he asked them, are you offended at this? And apparently some of them were. And so Jesus asked, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? You know, would seeing such a thing convince them that the words of Jesus, were, the words Jesus was speaking were true? If they saw him ascend into heaven, would that make a difference? No. I mean, they'd, be, they'd stand in awe. They'd gape into heaven, but that would not be the thing that would cause them to believe. Because you see, seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. Faith enables a person to see what cannot otherwise be seen. Seeing with the eyes of the heart, not with the eyes inside our heads. Jesus says as much in verse 63, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Throughout this chapter, we've been hearing this exact message. The things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. The flesh cannot understand the things of the Spirit. God has got to draw a person to Jesus because the hold the world has on every human being is too great for us to overcome on our own. It's like the world has the hold on us like a super magnet would have on us. We can't break that hold. God has to draw us away from that. Now I do want to point out that when Jesus says the flesh profits nothing in verse 63, he is not saying that our flesh is worthless or that somehow we ought to cast off our flesh in uh, preference to the spirit. No, he's not saying that. You know, God created us to be body, mind, and spirit. Three parts, body, mind, and spirit. Flesh and blood. That's his creation, and it's good. But there was a heresy already beginning in the first century. It's called Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis, 
and gnosis means knowledge. Well, the Gnostics thought they, they had a special knowledge that was higher than, you know, ordinary knowledge, and it was a spiritual knowledge. And somehow, well, they taught that somehow you had to get rid of the body and just focus on the spirit because the body is going to be sloughed off someday in preference to the, the spirit. And, you know, they were absolutely wrong. Why? Because God is the, is the one who created our flesh. He called it good. And Jesus came in the flesh in order to redeem us in the flesh. So if all that is true, to say that the flesh amounts for nothing, or counts for nothing, is simply not true. The Gnostics failed to see this, but Jesus said, no. You know, when it comes to discerning spiritual things, the flesh profits nothing. The Spirit of God must give us the understanding. The flesh can't do this. But he, Jesus, came to redeem this flesh. We are in John 6, and at this point, we don't know how many disciples Jesus has. We know there are more than 12, because in the end, we're going to see the 12 are still there. But apparently, there is a bunch of disciples, quite a number of people. Jesus knew who did believe and who did not believe. He knew who truly belonged to him and who did not belong to him. We hear this beginning in verse 64. Jesus said, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it is granted or it has been granted to him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. I have no doubt that that grieved the Lord. Because I know that God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Unfortunately, this super magnet, this world's grip that is on us, is really, really got a hold on us. And, you know, when people are trying to figure out the things of the Spirit through the flesh, it's just not going to work. So these people that went away, they were choosing the world instead of Jesus. Did they stay that way, or did they at some point make a new decision? We don't know that. But at this point, they turned and stopped following Jesus. And, of course, that's extremely sad, because a choice that that they make would, you know, if they would die right then and there, they'd lose their, I mean, they would spend eternity apart from Jesus. And that is a very bad thing. Having seen so many turn away from him and no longer were walking with him, Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Do you also want to go away? The freedom to walk away from Jesus was there all along. Would the twelve leave him too? Verse 68, But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter understood. There was nowhere else for them to go. Nowhere, no one else to turn to. Jesus had the words of eternal life. These twelve wanted eternal life. They didn't want what the world had to offer. They wanted what Jesus had to offer. These twelve also had reached the conclusion, not that they had reached it on their own, but that the truth had been revealed to them by God and they believed it. Peter says, Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Did Jesus' heart leap for joy when he heard Peter's words? Mine would have. Peter got it. The twelve got it. Or so Peter thought, but we hear differently in verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Jesus' words were probably hard for Peter to hear, and yet they were true. There was one among them who had betrayed Jesus to the Jews, and who eventually, that would eventually lead to Jesus' death. 
John, the writer of the Gospel of John, did not know that it was Judas until, you know, much later. But in time, he would come to know that. And when he was writing the Gospel of John, he included these words. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. We've come to the conclusion of John 6. Now, I don't know about you, but to me it was just an amazing, amazing chapter. Primarily, for me, it was all the depth of insight that was given to me. Because, you know, growing up in August, if you go through the liturgical church year, August being the season of Pentecost, there would be six weeks, I'm pretty sure it was six weeks, devoted to John chapter 6. And I distinctly recall a pastor once saying, we're in John 6, Jesus is the bread of life chapter. And he just was like, you know, it hadn't been revealed to him how amazing this chapter actually was. But this time around, I mean, God just downloaded it to me. That God, he, Jesus was setting up a compare and contrast between what the world had to offer and what he had to offer. You know, the bread that doesn't last versus him. You know, the fact that the bread that, the bread that we're going to eat later on. We're going to eat it. We will be full. But hey, by 5 o'clock this afternoon or sooner, we'll be hungry again. You know, it doesn't last. But the bread he has to give us lasts forever. And so, you know, it isn't a ho-hum, this is a 71-verse cha uh, chapter. My goodness, we're going to have to plot our way through this. No, it is meat and potatoes for us to eat this, this particular chapter. It's a great chapter. Amen.